follow the example of the other participants in thanking our gracious hosts um, for giving me the opportunity to be at this splendid conference in this absolutely wonderful place. Um, I am, my title is In Search of Maneuver, uh, the British and Gallipoli. So perhaps I should start with uh, an explanation of the terms I'm going to use in this uh, talk. Uh, first of all, maneuver. What do I mean by maneuver? Um, here, I'm referring to the type of uh, armed conflict and aspiration which is aimed to outsmart the adversary either by attacking from an unexpected direction or an unexpected way. It's the opposite of a traditionalist confrontational direct attack. It's sometimes called the indirect approach. And the second thing I want to talk about briefly is what I call, what is called, uh, the levels of war. Uh, the military members of the audience will be well familiar with this. Uh, there are three. You have a strategic level of war, which is about war. It's about the general war. You have the operational level of war, which is about campaigning. And you have the tactical level of war, which is about battle. All of these three things, of course, are connected. A mistake at the top of the strategic level can cascade down and cause chaos at the bottom. Similarly, a tactical error at the bottom can work its way up, undermining the strategic aim of the exercise. But they are all linked. None of these words maneuver all the levels of war were used by the protagonists in the Gallipoli campaign at the time. But my argument is that they were all being worked for, even though they didn't use the words. My proposition, in fact, is that Britain's plans, aspirations, and assumptions were manoeuvrist at all three levels of war, but failed in each to failures of execution. So let me start at the top of the pyramid, at the strategic um, level at the very top, the level of grand strategy and the search for manoeuvre at that level. As far as the British were concerned, there was huge fear of what became known at the time as Middle Europa. The notion that Germany, Austria-Hungary and Turkey uh, would link together to form a formidable Eurasian heartland that would threaten British imperial communications, uh, particularly uh, with India. So the aim was to prevent that happening. And there was an opportunity in the early stages of 1915 uh, to do just that. At this stage, the British were only just mobilizing for full-scale continental style war. Almost anything they produced in 1915 would be too small to have a major strategic effect on the Western Front. But it did provide an opportunity to use those very same forces much more cost-effectively in a secondary theatre such as Gallipoli, where their effect would be much greater than if they were simply drip-fed into uh, the war on the Western Front. But this was a temporary opportunity. And Towards the end of 1915, it became very clear that the seeds of disaster had been sown right from the beginning because there were major differences of opinion amongst the British leaders as to how temporary temporary was and how much leeway uh, people commanding and supporting the Gallipoli campaign would have before there was this demand to concentrate on the main theatre in Europe. In, 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 France. The Easterners were sceptical throughout, continuing doubts about the wisdom of even a temporary diversion into a secondary campaign, summarised with characteristic bluntness by General Munro, 
who eventually was the one who commanded, who conducted the British evacuation from the campaign. France, he said, is the only place Germany can be beaten. Every man not employed in killing Germans in France and Flanders is wasted. So, what was the aim? Well, we've, we know enough about it already. The aim was basically to support Russia, <coughs> to knock out Turkey, uh, win the support of the Balkans, destroy the, the nightmare of uh, Middle Europa. Initially, the idea was that sea power, British sea power, would actually execute the mission, not just facilitate it by being able to get through the straits, proceed off Dardanelles, or off Constantinople, and somehow uh, uh, to force Turkey out of the war. When that failed, the task of sea power was to facilitate the army, uh, to enlist the army, if you like, to get the navy through uh, the Dardanelles and to justify and to hold their position afterwards. So, if that was broadly speaking the idea, why did the search for strategic maneuver fail? I think the first reason really was what I call strategic inattention. Strategic maneuver only works if there's clarity of aim. If everyone knows what the aim is and everyone agrees uh, what it requires. And it simply did not get this at any stage. What, for example, was the Navy to do if it actually turned up of Constantinople and somehow the Turks didn't give in? This had never been thought about at all. The haste with which the second phase of the operation, that is the landing operation, was conducted was simply incredible. Something organized in the shape of a month. And this again is characteristic of a lack of preparation, a lack of forethought about what the grand strategy would actually require in the way of resources and the method. And those resources were in any case insufficient, especially at the start of the campaign, when they were, if you like, had their greatest potential. In all, the British conducted some, um, the, the Allies took something like 17 divisions into uh, Gallipoli. If more of these had been present at the start of the campaign, instead of fed in in small reinforcements during it, the outcome might have been very different. And it's not just a question of having resources, it's also a question of distributing them. And this was um, grossly inefficient as well especially at that critical early stage of the operation. Lemnos was simply not capable of delivering the kind of resources in the time and uh, with the efficiency uh, that success required. All of this was a consequence of the first governor of, of Lemnos, British governor that is, um, summarized in his book, Admiral Weems. Never, he said, in the history of the world, has such an expedition sailed? Never has a big campaign been so hastily organized and got together. And never has such an undertaking had so little consideration been given from home. And the example of that that people always quote is the terrible story of the wounded. We've already seen, we saw uh, another version of this picture we took yesterday. This is a terrible treatment of uh, the wounded in the early stages of the campaign before the scale of the requirement had been realized by the people organizing uh, that campaign. The sheer scale of the operation had been grossly underestimated. So that really explains, I think, why at the, the level of grand strategy <coughs> maneuver eluded the British and their allies. But now let's go down to the operational level, the level of the campaign in the whole theatre. I don't think you can really deny that it was, if you like, manoeuvrist in conception. 
even the Navy-only operation was brilliantly imaginative, if it worked, and if um, it, it, it had been thought through more. It made a point of utilizing the strength of the Allies, which was their command of the sea, to decide the rules, if you like, uh, of the, the whole war. <coughs> you can argue the same about the land phase, the amphibious phase of the operation too. General Hamilton's aim, after all, was to seek operational and tactical surprise. Couldn't aim for strategic surprise because the um, Turks knew more or less what, what was coming, but you could get operational tactical surprise. And so a whole series of threats uh, was made uh, to the uh, Turkish coast from Bule down to the Asi Asiatic shore. The aim was to keep uh, the Turks off balance, so they wouldn't know where the major point, the major attack was coming, coming from. And even when the amphibious assault of the theater of the operation was over, still Hamilton aimed to keep forces back in ports of Lemnos once again, uh, so the Turks would not know where the next phase of the operation, the land operation, would actually be. They would never know, would never be able to concentrate uh, their forces against uh, uh, the invaders. But it was maneuverous as an idea, but extremely demanding. And my old mentor, Professor Sir Michael Howe, is summed up like this. And because we've lost them a bit, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, the amphibious diversion, the attack on the Dardanelles, said Sir Michael Howard, a brilliant, almost flawless strategic concept, had met the fate of virtually every British amphibious operation since the age of Elizabeth. All brilliant in conception, all lamentable in execution. The surprise and mobility which Liddell Hart had seen as the essence of British maritime strategy, so far from ensuring success, has resulted over the centuries in an almost unbroken record of expensive and humiliating failures from which Wolf's seizure of Quebec stands out as one of the few exceptions. A skeptic. Michael Howard um, is not uh, an enthusiast for the indirect approach and for amphibious operations. But he makes the point that this kind of style of war is particularly demanding um, in terms of its basic requirements. So, again, how do you explain failure at the operation level? Well, fundamentally, the plans were ambitious, intricate, complicated. It, they assumed a static, irresolute, bewildered adversary. But the Turks were none of these. <coughs> So complex plans fell to pieces almost immediately, uh, both in the landing phase and the exploitation phase uh, during the uh, campaign. The troops got ashore, but they were unable to establish bridgeheads that were big enough to support that major operation thereafter before Turkish reinforcements arrived. There was also what the Americans like to call poor situational awareness of geography, of topography, of the position and quality of the adversary. And then there were command problems of many sorts, a separate substantial problem of its own. Not oddly between the Allies, although as we've just heard, the British and French did not coordinate at the ground level of strategy at all well, uh, but at the operational and tactical levels. Uh, the main problem, though, as far as the campaign was concerned, was within the British forces, the Allied forces. Um, three sorts, I think. The first problem was the top-down ambiguity. Who was in charge of this operation? London? All the theatre commanders. The theatre commanders all complained of insufficient direction, 
an insufficient support um, from London. Uh, those in London complained of not being told accurately of what the situation was. There was this big confusion um, of who actually was in command. And one of the problems here, of course, uh, was connected to the second type of command problem, inter-service cooperation. If this operation was conducted today, uh, the military would insist on the appointment of a theatre commander, an overall military commander who would take responsibility for conducting the operation as a whole. But in Gallipoli, this did not happen. Uh, the Army and the Navy worked together surprisingly well, uh, given those circumstances, uh, but they fought separate campaigns <coughs> where their synergistic effect of supporting each other uh, was not uh, properly uh, realized. The third type of command problem was the relationship between senior officers and junior officers on the Allied side, particularly the British side, I would say. These days, it's very fashionable to talk about mission command. The idea that the senior commander gives in general terms the aim of the exercise and delegates downwards responsibility for executing the mission to his subordinates and doesn't interfere unless something really drastic happens. And this was institutionalized within the British Army. This was the idea, but nonetheless, it was insufficiently uh, institutionalized. And there were two problems. The first problem was that the commander's intent, what the commander actually <coughs> wanted his subordinates to do, was all too often as a Y Beach landings, for example, or the Suvla operation on the 6th of August, not properly communicating to his um, its subordinate officers. There was ambiguity. Worse, neither side realized there was ambiguity until too late. But the idea of mission command prevented Hamilton from interfering to sort the problem out because that would go against the spirit of the whole exercise. So although the army system looked like mission command, in fact it wasn't. So lastly, uh, the tactical level, the search for tactical uh, manoeuvre, if you like. Now Hamilton's ideas for <coughs> achieving manoeuvre, achieving the capacity to have decisive effect in battle, was based on the idea of surprise. That the Turks would not know where the enemy was coming in strength and would therefore not be able to gather sufficient forces to stop the advance. And in those circumstances where a complete tactical surprise was not possible, the fighting superiority of the Allied soldiers over uh, their Turkish adversaries was assumed, partly because of uh, lack of that situational awareness I was talking about before. But the fact of the matter was that local conditions made this extremely difficult. In fact, you might say impossible. The topography was terrible. The climate was awful. There were inadequate supplies. <coughs> Very poor local knowledge of the strength of, uh, and position of, of the adversary. And worse in many ways, the technological state um, of the development of the war, in any case, had reached one of those phases when entrenched firepower in the shape of defences, machine guns, barbed wire, and all the rest of it, had achieved a kind of dominance of the battlefield, um, as was only too um, clear in the Western Front. And it was the reason why major breakthroughs had proved impossible in the war so far. That's why the third Battle of Privia in May um, 1915, the war had become just like the Western Front. 
the plan was to achieve surprise, no, not to achieve surprise, basically to achieve the capacity to blast uh, the enemy with superior artillery, suppress his defences, and then advance. Just exactly the same as on the Western Front, and it, and it failed. So conditions in, in uh, the locality uh, made this kind of maneuverish aspiration almost impossible to achieve. And I would argue that this was just as true uh, for the Tur Turkish adversaries as it was for the Allies, which is one of the reasons why their losses were so high and they failed to achieve decisive effect either in most of their attacks. The conditions were against this style of war. Let me try and illustrate this a bit by taking my local regiment, the 5th Wiltshire's, 5th Battalion of the Wiltshire Regiment, uh, based in devices uh, four miles away uh, from where I live. The 5th Wiltshire's were some of the first of General Kitchener's new army. They were all volunteers, uh, they'd been trained over a period of about <coughs> 10 weeks, uh, they were brave, they were keen, they were totally inexperienced. They were part of the 40th Brigade of the 13th British Division. They arrived in the theatre in July 1915. They were the reinforcements that General Hamilton had asked for urgently back in mid-May which in itself kind of makes a point. They were basically first sent to the Hellies Front, where they were occupying the Hampshire Cut and the Eastern Knoll, <coughs> I'm sorry, the Essex Knoll in the northeast quadrant of the very complicated Hellies Front, which to all intents and purposes was just like the Western Front. Um, that was their introduction to fire, if you like, uh, where their first losses uh, were suffered. They were acclimatised to a certain extent at Helles in this area. And then they were pulled back to Lemos uh, for a brief period of recovery, and then using the manoeuvrability that came about with superior sea power, they were reinserted into the theatre. Uh, but this time into the Anzac sector, where they were sent in to support uh, the Anzac breakout that was supposed to occur at the same time of the solar landings on the 6th of August. So they participated in the four-day battle of Sari Bear. And you can see from this contemporary map just how demanding uh, the conditions were. Uh, they were in this position here, right in the center of the campaign. They were fighting alongside troops, the Australians, New Zealanders, other British units, <coughs> Sikhs, Gurkhas, um, that they'd never cooperated with before they arrived. In the four day battle of Surrey Bear, they were expected and asked by these overcomplicated, intricate campaign um, battle plans to advance at night up some of these very narrow defiles. Uh, and of course, everything went wrong. The guides that were provided by the New Zealanders got lost, not surprisingly, in the circumstances. So for three days, they got no water, no supplies, no food. Um, The heat was terrible. They were encountering at every stage friendly forces in total confusion, just like them, uh, also Turkish counterattacks. And they found themselves on August the 10th, directly in the path of uh, Kemal, um, counterattack by the 7th and 12th uh, Turkish divisions under Mustafa Kemal. It was a total defeat, a dead mark in that morning of August 10, early, early morning, uh, they lost over half of their people, uh, some of them at least. 
none of them, incidentally, in the two cemeteries that we looked at yesterday. But the fifth Wiltshire's recovered after this ghastly experience. Um, they were reinforced by new chants coming out from the They stayed in the Anzac sector, just like all the rest, um, until the Anzac sector was evacuated, uh, where they were pulled back to Lemnos as part of the British 13th Division. But in December, the 5th Wilkes discovered that they were not going to be sent home, as they had hoped for. Instead, as part of the 13th Division, they were reinserted into the theatre, oops, sorry, um, back into the heavy sector. There's the 13th Division, same area as they were in last time, um, to hold the line until the heavy sector uh, was finally uh, to be evacuated um, in January of 1916. Here the 5th Worlds helped to defend the last great Turkish attack of the campaign uh, just over 24 hours before the final evacuation uh, from Helis and the 5th Worlds uh, were some of the last to leave. So, what are the conclusions that come out of this? Well, first of all, I think one has to say that despite its ultimate failure, getting there and staying there in the conditions was on its own uh, a major achievement. And even by the Strupler landings of the 6th of August, it was clear uh, that much had been learned and many of the original mistakes were not repeated. And as so often, Sir Julian Corbett put it particularly well. Um, in that marvellous evacuation, he said, we see the national genius for amphibious warfare raised to its highest manifestation. In hard experience and in successive disappointments, uh, the weapon had been brought to a perfect temper. And when the hour of fruition came to show of what great things it was capable, it was only used to effect a retreat. But that was a retreat without casualties. The British were not put off by the Dardanelles experience about the possibility of manoeuvre through amphibious assault. The best example of that actually uh, nearly occurred in 1917, where again, thinking in terms of opening up static fronts, the British proposed to land um, a division here in what was the most heavily defended coastline in the world in order to open up the otherwise static uh, western front. It was extraordinarily ambitious, and some of the techniques and the technologies that were prepared for this particular operation were analogous to those used in Normandy uh, in 1944. But of course, it's one of those campaigns that never happened. And the reason for it was that the initial idea of a, of a offensive in this area to drag German troops away from the coast and therefore to open up the possibility of an assault around the side, which would then restore movement, if you like, to the Western Front, uh, ended in catastrophe. And that particular attritionist frontal assault here, the Passchendaele campaign of 1917, never delivered uh, the preliminary conditions for a campaign. So that never happened. But it's illustrative of the fact that the British thought seriously that they could do it, that indicates that they thought the lessons of Gallipoli uh, had been well learned. So finally, what are the fifth worlds? Well, as the once again they were disappointed. They weren't sent home. Again, through British sea power, they were conducted to another part of the theatre to do the same thing. Um, uh, they were transported to Mesopotamia, where they participated in the much more difficult, uh, equal, uh, the diff different but much more successful campaign to take Kut, Baghdad, and to advance once more on Constantinople uh, by war's end, but this time from a different direction. But by the end of the war, 
uh, the centre had closed uh, rather than the edge. So perhaps uh, Sir Michael Howard was right after all. But even then, when the war finally finished, the 5th Wiltshire's were still not sent home. They were actually sent to the northwest frontier to support the empire in India. And finally got back to the Isis in 1920, where they were disbanded and became known as the Forgotten Battalion. Thank you very much.